Okay, hi everybody. This is the first question and answer video. It's going to be a short and sweet one. I've got just a few questions here that people have. Um, I'm going to be doing these question and answer videos quite regularly on my membership site as a way for people to interact with me and a way for people to just, just uh, the questions about rider fitness and then questions about fitness and health in general because I know that a lot of you want to get fit to ride but rider specific fitness comes at the, at the very end of your fitness journey because you need a good general uh, conditioning and fitness base and you need a to master general functional strength movement patterns and so a lot of the first part of your fitness journey is really going to be um, building that solid base and all the specific exercises really come when you've nailed that beginning bit um, which I think is important for us to remember that we don't just go straight into, into the end phases miss out all the bits in the beginning and then get ourselves injured and so that's why you know at the early stages of your training you can mix it up a little bit you can do like push pulls total bodies, you could do different types of training in the beginning and then what I would program you specifically at the end point might be quite different. Um, so if you've got any questions on that then feel free to ask me but it can be on nutrition in general, it can be on health in general, you know some of you might want to get fit to ride but you also might just want to look better and that's a different type of training and it's certainly not going to make you less fit to ride, in fact it will probably help you quite a lot. So I probably will start doing a few posts on like not bodybuilding, but like more aesthetic type of training that is still going to help you with your riding, but perhaps isn't like the most specific way. And yeah, if you've got any like questions about that, then feel free to ask me. So I've got a question here from Victoria and she asks, are there any exercises that can be translated to into the stirrups? So I wasn't 100% sure what was meant by this um, question, so I'll, I'll interpret it the way I feel and then you can always ask me another question. I personally am a real big advocate of training off the horse and that do, doing anything on the horse skillful and that you're going to improve your general endurance strength base for riding whilst you're on the horse and the more horses you ride and the more you're on the horse the better that you're going to get at that side of things and then training off the horse is going to help translate over to your on horse riding so it's not going to hinder you it's just going to help you so I'm a really big believer that you should do as much off horse training as you can, but the on horse training is always going to be the most important factor for your ridden performance. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not a big fan of doing exercises on the horse. However, if you are, if your horse is cooling off, or you're on a loose rein and you've got a say fish horse, you could do things like legs away, legs down, knees up. Knee, you, you know, this typical like lunge type exercises. They are going to help, um, but you just need to be careful about what your um, translate into your horse underneath uh, and it depends on the type of horse that you're riding um, so because legs away you know moving your legs behind legs in front of the horse all those things are going to improve glute med strength which is something that riders tend to be quite um, poor at um, but you're going to get the same training stimulus if you did that off the horse um, so you could, you could do things like that um, in terms of anything that directly relates to being in the stirrups, the stirrups is a tricky little mechanism to replicate because obviously you've got your feet in a, on an unstable surface and it's only the ball of your foot. So like I said, with that sport specific training, once you've gone through a really good general training base, then at that point I might start getting you to do, well, the first progression would be like single legged exercises on a stable platform. So like I might get you to hold on to a resistance band or TRX and then squat down with just the one leg and get that one leg firing so that it can fire. So you can fire the glute and the quad and the ham without the... Because what you'll see when people do single leg stuff is they start tipping the, the hips. And you're going to have to a little bit because you're on one leg. But you want to try and avoid that as much as possible. So that's really going to work the core and work your independent legs. So that's something that we start to do. And you'll see that in your programs if you have personal programming with me or you do the event fit phases you'll see that you'll start to see single leg exercises come in a bit more then we can go to your double leg um like stabilitative exercises so like standing on a half foam roller or on a bosu or i mean you're not going to be able to really mimic that stirrup um type exercise unless you're on a mechanical horse or something um but something that's unstable and to get you to work on that like double-legged balance on something on something unstable and then eventually um, do single-legged exercises on an unstable surface so but doing a single leg squat on a bosu ball is 
pretty tough. So that would come like towards the end of the training. So my advice to you, if you want to do anything that translates to the stirrups is, you know, if you've got a nice horse that's going to, it's not going to bomb off with you, then yes, you can do things like legs away, but, um, and things like that. But I personally would advocate that you concentrate off the horse and just concentrate on your riding. Don't worry about your own strength when you're on the horse. That's going to, you know, your strength endurance is going to come just from riding lots of horses. And then I would worry about the additional ancillary benefits of training off the horse and do, um, those sorts of exercises so I hope that kind of answers the question a little bit and, and if it doesn't or you want specific exercises ask away and I can answer an, another question so Gillian asks is measuring heart rate during a workout worth du doing during hit and Tabata style workouts and what percentage of max heart rate should we be working at great question so I believe that monitoring your heart rate during all training maybe not so much weight training but certainly during circuit based training or long slow distance training is beneficial uh, I'm actually going to be receiving a new heart rate monitor that I will be demoing on my member's site soon and I'll be showing you why and how I would use heart rate monitoring for training. Um, so the reason we like to monitor heart rate is it can record no, like loads of different things. So you can measure your heart rate, your percentage of heart rate. So you can do a heart rate max test or just use a prediction to um, work out your heart rate max. And you know exactly what intensity you're working at. And sometimes when you're tired or you haven't eaten enough or you're dehydrated or it's a hot day then, or you're stressed, your heart rate can get elevated by loads of different things and you might feel that a workout is harder than it actually is if you're not measuring it. So if you have a heart rate monitor, I would whack it on. It doesn't need to be anything fancy. Like you said, percentage of heart rate is a good way to start. You can also then start to track your recovery time and there's loads of apps, particularly if you have like... Um, Apple, you can you have Polar Flow and Polar Beat, and you can download your training, and you can look at how quickly you're recovering. So your you know your average heart rate might be the same, but you might actually be recovering after intervals the best, which is what we want. Um, so for dressage riders, your test is going to be five to eight minutes, maybe depending on level and all sorts of things. Um, and your heart rate is going to be seventy to eighty percent of your heart rate max. So you want to be training at least that, if not more. So you want to be training around that heart rate. Now, funny thing with dressage is, dressage, um, particularly for event riders, is the phase that their heart rate elevates the most before competition, because I guess for them, it's a big determination of how they're going to do overall, and it tends to be the thing that dressage, uh, event riders, in my, in my experience, tend to worry about the most and therefore they get this psycho-emotional response and their heart rate elevates. I think their heart rate was about 155 on average beats per minute. The minute before the competition during the dressage it was higher than for the show jumping and cross country and this is when they're just sitting there not riding they're just the one minute before they go and they're just sitting there and the heart rate is massively elevated. Um, and it doesn't matter what elevates the heart rate if the heart rate is elevated, you're still going to get fatigued and metabolites and you're still going to get tired. And generally, if it's a psycho-emotional stressor that's causing the heart rate, it's going to affect your posture too. And that isometric tension that comes from the posture is further going to elevate your heart rate and make you tired. So the fitter you are, the better you're going to offset all of that and then the less you're going to experience joint freezing, confusion from fatigue, etc. So for you dressage riders, I would encourage you to track your heart rate just as much as an event rider. Um, but you're probably looking for the ability to control the intensity at 70 to 80 percent for a longer period of time. Um, that said, if you do the high intensity interval training, it's going to have a, a knock on effect on the endurance as well. For event riders, you need to be able to work at 80 to 90 percent of your maximal heart rate for five minutes um, minimum and then still be able to have good for oh, I nearly saw back to the good cognitive control um you need to offset fatigue because you know a lot of the riders i've worked with they see them get to fence seven and fence eight and the posture starts to go and they're getting out of path and the arms are flailing around all over the place and they're sort of you can see them trying to make decisions and they're getting a bit out of breath and we want to try and offset that we want to try and make you able to offset that fatigue so one of the things we do in the 30 day challenge is we do five minutes of high intensity interval training then your body weight resistance exercises. Then we do five minutes of high intensity interval training and then we do body weight exercise. Now, if you were tracking your heart rate, you would be able to see the progress in your heart rate. So you'd be able to see the relative intensity hopefully decrease. You'd be able to see how quickly you recovered between rounds. You'd be able to see your heart rate during those um, body weight 
and how your body's responding to the fatigue. And so, in my opinion, if you can track your heart rate, then it's great because it gives you an actual objective number to work with to see progress rather than just, I feel better. And then you can, I know you can't wear your heart rate monitor during your actual cross country, but perhaps if you're training or anything like that, you can actually do a little on horse ridden test, perhaps. And you can actually see, you know, does that, does it decrease? Does your relative heart rate decrease? So, I personally would, um, if you can, um, monitor your heart rate and aim for 80 to 90 percent of it during your high intensity interval training in your Tabata and about 70 to 80 percent during like your steady state perhaps a bit lower on the on the um, recovery steady state days maybe like 60 to 70 percent. Um, I am actually going to be doing some blogs when I get my new Polar Watch to the post. I'm going to be doing some blogs and I'm going to be doing some like I'm going to do workouts and then show you my heart rate and show you what you're looking for. So hopefully that'll be interesting. And the last question is about nutrition. What should we aim for? Well, I'm actually going to put a blog post up on nutrition for the day of competition. But with riders, because I mean, the physiological demands are there, you know, like it is hard to horse ride, but it's not a sport where you need to make weight. Well, racing is, but you know, generally. So we don't need to worry about nutritional restriction. And also it's not like, I don't want to belittle it, but it's not massively physiologically demanding to the point that you're not going to be able to compete if you don't eat right. And this is why so many people get away with stuff in their face with chocolate because they get a quick energy bars and then they're off and off they go and they have a bit of caffeine in there and they're fine. Really what we want for horse riding into any really discipline is like slow release carbohydrate. And the timing of competition is often quite difficult for horse riders so as a general health and fitness perspective you should be aiming to have a nutritionally balanced diet with a good amount of carbohydrate good amount of fat and good amount of protein and the protein is on oft often a place where people lack they don't distribute the protein throughout the day and they tend to have one big you know meat and veg type meal and then they feel sluggish afterwards so my first uh, general rule of thumb would be to try to add protein to every single meal at least your main meals so I personally tend to eat five to six times a day I tend to have I haven't eaten breakfast yet I don't know what time it is here quarter to eight and the reason I do I try to offset my breakfast a little bit more because yes I'm hungry but I've had a cup of coffee and I'm going to go and have breakfast in a minute I'm probably going to have some eggs and some tomatoes and some cheese or something like that um, and I find if I just push it back to like eight eight then um you know, by lunchtime, because I, I tend to get hungry like every three hours, but I feel like if I can offset the breakfast a little bit, then I kind of get to the end of the day and I'm not starving, whereas if I eat at six when I get up, then I'm hungry again by eight. So that tends to be what I do. I also time it around my workout, so I tend to have something that's higher in carb after my workout and before my workout and try to save the carbs to fuel the workout. For you guys, you're gonna have things like working on the yard. You know, if you're up really early and you're doing something really physical, I would probably try to get something in your body. Whether that's a protein shake or whether it's a banana or an apple, I would try and avoid doing too much on an empty stomach because you get used to that and then you get used to that feeling of the crash and then, oh, I need to stuff my face and then the crash and stuff my face. And not only does it cause things like, you know, diabetes in the long run it's also going to cause really unhealthy eating patterns that you feel that you really need and don't get me wrong I'm part of this club too but that you really need that chocolate or you need that you need something really sugary or you're just not going to get through the day so I would start by splitting down your meals and don't think of your snacks as snacks I've said this so many times when you think of a snack I personally in my mind when I think of snacks I think of something that I can just grab and shove in my face like crisps or chocolate or they have these goldfish crackers over here or something that you just basically open a cupboard and eat that's that's what I in my head when I say snack that's what I'm thinking of so I would try and get some nutritionally dense food and think of it as meals rather than snacks um so things like you know a couple of rice cakes and a Greek yogurt as a as meal two rather than your snack because it's already thought about you've already planned it you've already got it I mean there's no reason why anyone can't eat rice cakes or Greek yogurt on the go, they're quite convenient, you can buy them in, in shops. Protein shakes is my go-to, I pretty much always have one on me for that moment of I need to stuff my face. Um, try to have something different for breakfast, mix up your breakfast, add protein powder, make chia seed pudding, um, add some protein powder to your oatmeal, have eggs in the morning, um, you can make little mini egg muffins, you just basically mix up some eggs 
um, some vegetables and then put them in like mini muffin tip, you know, in the muffin tin and then stick it in the oven and then you've got like 12 muffins and you can have like two in the morning. Um, so there's lots of ideas and I can put, I will be putting these ideas up on my new website. I'm really excited to show you. And um, what else would I do? I would always have a meal, so some sort of nutritionally dense meal and a shake or something on me so that if I was having that moment of, of um, need that I had it on me. I would also though, and this is what I've learned over time, don't be too restrictive with yourself because when you start being really restrictive, that's when you're gonna want something. So um, there's loads of different ways to start thinking about nutrition. I have started to count my macros, so my fats, carbs and protein. It just keeps me on track. I do, do it with my fitness pal and um, it just helps me realise what I'm eating. So when I want a bagel with peanut butter on and I look and I'm like, oh, the bagel has like 35 grams of carbs and that's like a third of my daily intake. Do I want that or would I rather have some rice with my dinner later or would I rather basically just have egg on its own or, you know. So it makes you just second guess. But that's not for everybody, it takes a bit of time. And so just generally balancing, make sure you've got a protein, a fat and a carb in each of your meals. Um, uh, the struggle is for me getting the protein in because I'm a vegetarian so things like cottage cheese and I know cottage, everyone's like Bleh, cottage cheese but if you, you can actually put cottage cheese in like protein pancakes you put cottage cheese in scrambled egg you'd never even know it was in there put cottage cheese I, I mean personally I love it but some people like really hate it and you can have it sweet as well so actually like cottage cheese with some stevia and some cinnamon and some fruit in it it's actually quite nice um, you can put it in porridge loads of, loads of stuff um, so Cottage cheese, Greek yogurt, protein powders, um, meat substitutes tend to be my, my go-tos, egg whites, to get the protein up in my meals. Um, but for the day of competition, I would, you know, just try to, do, keep, to keep the same concept. Have six small meals. You're not going to, you don't want to feel full before you're riding. If you don't want to eat before you ride, fine. But just make sure you've had something before you, a couple of hours before you get on the horse and then something within the hour after you get off. Particularly if you're in an event ride and you've got three phases, it's really just not a good idea to go the whole day without eating and then eat the hot dog and the coke and the chocolate afterwards. And I'm not saying don't do that because you've just competed. Like, um, we, we all are treats. I think trying to live to this, like, clean eating all the time is, is not going to happen. But make sure that it's well thought out and deserved and that you're having it after your competition and not, like, before, so you're not going to get crashed before your next phase. Um, but yeah, so if there's any specific questions about nutrition, I would be pleased to answer them. But I think the main thing is just try to keep it balanced. Like, make sure that you save the, the, the goodies for the days that you deserve it, or when you're out with friends or family, or when you need that glass of wine. And try not to restrict it too much. And for me, if I need chocolate, I have it, but I just put it into my macros. Um, and I put it into my fitness pal so that it's, you know, I've decided to have half a chocolate bunny, which is what I did on Easter at, like, 9 in the morning. And then it meant, basically, that was, like... 400 calories of my day taken and all carb, no fat, hardly any fat, I hadn't any protein and I was pretty much hungry as a result of it. So that was my choice, that's what I wanted to do at the time. Um, yeah, so if you have any specific questions about nutrition, I'd be happy to help, but that's my general ramblings. And thank you for listening, if you got this far, we're sort of 15, 20 minutes in and I'll be posting lots of these, so fire away with all your questions and I'll be happy to answer them as best I can. Bye for now.